God could have chosen anywhere on earth, but he chose Israel. He could have revealed his redemption anywhere. He chose Jerusalem. The house of the Lord might have been any place on earth. He chose Mount Moriah. Past, present, and future, the mountain of the Lord has been a beacon of hope and remains a strategic site for the next temple of God. Dateline Jerusalem, the coming temple. We're so glad you joined us today. We are plowing through this wonderful series and a lot more to come. Yeah. What's going on today, guys? I, I love how we're, we've been talking about the prophecy, the past, the future, the Temple Mount, this tiny little place with so much controversy. If you want to start some controversy, go over there, take a knee and start praying and see what happens. I promise you it's going to go badly for you. I mean, intifadas have started from less than that. It is the most contested site in the world because of a spiritual problem that's, you know, the temple once stood there. The enemy doesn't want the temple to be there. The temple will be there in the future, and that means Yeshua will rule and reign from there one day, and that just stirs up the demons of hell. We're gonna hear more about that, but right now, Dr. Seif is on location at the Mount of Olives. Let's go there now. Television commentators typically want people to look at them. Here, however, I'd like to begin by asking you to look past me, look through me. No doubt the sight behind me will resonate with you as you focus on it, you realize where I am, it's Jerusalem. And you'll see what you're looking at, the Temple Mount. You would know that principally because of the gold dome that's atop it. It's an Islamic shrine. Marwan built that in 691. Well, he finished it in, in 691. For as much as people might recognize the site, S-I-T-E, what people have lost sight of, S-I-G-H-D, is what the hill is really all about. I mention that because uh, the Dome of the Rock behind me was in effect a pilgrim shrine for people to come and um, do their um, obedience to, to Allah. Um, that wasn't quite the original intention. I get that pilgrims uh, visit the space and I don't want to be disrespectful toward my uh, Islamic cousins, uh, but that space was designated for something other than a religion that appeared um, here uh, hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus. Uh, when I look at this site, um, I look at it with a biblical lens and I'm reminded of the fact that the Hekol was there, the temple was there, the Beit HaMikdash, and that the site is special not simply as a place for tourists to come, it's a place for people to come and transact business with the divine to bring front and center their sins and to experience God's redemption. I mention that because there's a verse that you may be familiar with, uh, not just to Leviticus where I'm reading from in 17, but it's so central to the Bible in so many ways. There's many chapters that deal with sacrifice on that site not Torah site, but sacrifice site, where animals were brought. It's so central to the biblical economy, there has to be the giving of a life in order to receive it. In Leviticus 17.11, he says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And he says, I've given it to you um, upon the altar. In fact, and that's particularly true with Jesus, where he gave his life upon the altar of the cross to make atonement for your souls. And Jesus certainly is, is recognized as doing that. For it's the blood that makes atonement for life. More than a Torah spot, um, that uh, when uh, you look at biblical literature, this was the spot. People came, they brought animals, they, they presented. You know, Calvary's in proximity to all that, the ultimate sacrifice. Now, in, in, in this series, uh, we're interested in the temple, to be sure, and the reemergence of it in modernity is worth consideration. But I don't want to walk past the ultimate, and that is how what was transacted here is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. That's the argument. I'll close my point. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, by the garden tomb 
It's a sacred space for Christians to come and remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And pilgrims sing songs, they have devotionals, and the song was sung, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Well, amen to that. It's, it's popular in Christianity. I'm glad it is. I want it to be remembered. But the place to remember the blood, the transaction of giving blood for life, it's the place behind me. Once upon a time, where once stood the temple, and it may very well be standing again in the foreseeable future. When, in 1831 BC, Abraham ascended Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son Isaac, he had no idea that one day that site would be called the Temple Mount. Two temples would eventually be built on the mount that would become Judaism's holiest site in the world. Some 600 years after the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, two mosques were built on the site, making it Islam's third holiest site in the world after Mecca and Medina. Today, as discussions abound regarding a third temple, the prophetic words of Isaiah become even more timely. I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem. I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, two Jewish brothers, very knowledgeable, very smart. This is something very interesting that we just learned. We're always taught the third temple. We don't think, as we just heard, that it's a huge complex. Correct. And you guys know about that. We think one temple, not kind of a massive complex is gonna be, right? Because the question becomes, what could be the problem if this temple or complex is there? Why, why can't it just sit next to everybody else on the dome of Earth? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think you can build the third temple because there's plenty of room and Al-Aqsa Mosque and Dome of Iraq will be in touch. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> They're gonna need that whole complex. And even when we read in Revelation, when, when John is to measure that third temple, it describes an inner court, describes an outer court for the Gentiles. That's more than just the temple area itself. Even if you're saying a oh, Dome of Iraq, that's where Solomon's temple was, or Dome of the Spirits, they still need more territory. And you know, the Muslims will never allow a Jewish temple to stand side by side with Al-Aqsa or the Dome of Iraq. And you see even in the times past, uh, Emperor Hadrian, in 167 uh, AD, he built a temple to Jupiter on that very site. So everybody tries to stake claim to that territory spiritually by, by putting their own house of worship there. And even when Jeff was there uh, teaching at that Eastern Gate, the Muslims were building, digging more mm -hmm. grave sites under that spot where right. the Eastern Gate lies. We'll be seeing him right there. Yes. I mean, that's coming up incredible mm -hmm. that they want this, that claim to that land, right? And but they say it's, it's the be. third holiest site. Right. But I promise you, it did not become Islam's third holiest site until after 1967, the Six Day War, when Israel reclaimed that territory of Jerusalem. But that was when an Arab force came to destroy Israel. And God supernaturally intervened this army of 10 to 1, and they took more territory of Judea and Samaria back, which is their God given inheritance. And then suddenly, it's the third holiest site in Islam. It's not mentioned anywhere in the Quran, you know, Jerusalem, this Temple Mount, but now it's so important to everybody. So you see that constant pressure building, mm -hmm. that constant tug of war. When you see something that doesn't make sense in the natural, that's when you know it has to be a spiritual battle. That's right. And that's why we're saying coexistence is not gonna happen in this situation because the enemy has no desire to coexist with God mm -hmm. and God is not gonna coexist with the enemy. And we know because of the Bible, it's gonna happen. The temple's gonna happen and everything else that happens next, so. In Daniel 9:27. It's talking about this beast, this Chaya, this Antichrist figure that makes a peace treaty. He confirms it with the Jews for seven weeks, for seven years. Obviously, Satan wants that temple to be built because that is the initiation point of the mm. construction of the third temple for the tribulation to begin, for him to take his seat of power. And so he's playing both sides here. Interesting. Rowling up. Israel's enemies, but at the same time, he's going to play the peacemaker with Israel, representing the Goy nation so that they can build that third temple, just so that he can abominate it later and pollute it and take his seat. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Eastern Gate is near that area we're talking about right now. Dr. Seif is there teaching. Let's go there now. Behind me is the Eastern Gate, or the old Eastern Gate, to the old city of Jerusalem, a fascinating spot. Proximate to it is a cemetery, and I'm standing in a cemetery right now, and I'm excited to do so. 
most people wouldn't think that's very exciting. This is a, an Arab Muslim cemetery adjacent to the Eastern Gate. And adjacent to this cemetery, this Muslim cemetery, is a Jewish cemetery that carpets a, a good section of the Mount of Olives. Now, when I tell you I'm excited to come to you from this place, that sounds, you know, a bit out of place for a cemetery, but those that are buried here are excited to be at this place for comparable reasons. They're getting box office seats to the greatest show on earth in the, uh, the, the, the Messianic era. Uh, I mention that because certainly, uh, and I speak more uh, to, to, to Jewish senses and sensibilities, uh, there's an anticipation of a resurrection to come. And not only is there an anticipation of a resurrection to come, and thus individuals want to be buried close to the holy city, in the holy city to come is, per the understanding of religious Jews, for reasons that we'll explore, comes the emergence of a temple complex. We know that Solomon built a temple. Uh, it was destroyed. Uh, exiles returned and Herod refurbished the temple. That was the temple in Jesus' day. Eventually that was felled. It was destroyed. But there's an understanding in biblical literature, both in the Newer Testament and the Older Testament, that there's another temple to come. And individuals believe, of course, there's only one place for it to be, and that's behind me here at the temple complex. I want to explore a text in a second that gives voice to the priests that will be officiating in that temple to come. But at the outset, what I want to do is overcome an objection that many evangelicals have with the notion of a rebuilt temple and a priesthood that is then uh, redeveloped in the temple. It's a judge to be superfluous in that Jesus Christ died for our sins and is uh, the high priest and sacrifice. Some allege that this is all uh, delusional, it's fantasy, because there's no need, because Jesus is the priest and the sacrifice. There's no need for a temple. There, 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 there's, there's no need for a priesthood. There's no need for a sacrifice. Historically, sacrifice has always been an integral part of atonement, both in the wilderness tabernacle and the ensuing Jerusalem temples. David Parsons gives his perspective on the third temple. Some uh, say, well, look, Jesus is our eternal sacrifice. There's no need for the sacrifice of animals there. And, and you know, that's all good and fine. Uh, and there are a lot of Jews who want to rebuild the temple. They're not so interested in the animal sacrifices or whatever, but recapturing that sort of glory that was there. Some say we shouldn't be involved in it because it's just going to be defiled by the Antichrist. And uh, you can actually find three places in the book of Daniel where he talks about the, an abomination of desolation, and each is a separate one. The fact that even Daniel prophesies all three of them, it was never a reason not to rebuild the temple. They rebuilt it the first time and such, so I don't think that's necessarily a reason not to rebuild it. If you don't want to be involved, you don't have to. It will be a very sensitive issue. Uh, biblical authors in both the Older and the Newer Testament give voice to a, uh, a coming new temple. With Israel's re being, uh, regathering as a nation state, uh, with uh, the retaking of Jerusalem as the holy city, uh, with all of that, uh, there are now interests in uh, the temple's redevelopment. And of course, in this series, we're exploring uh, in order to rededicate a rededicated temple, you need to have the ashes of red heifer, and even those have been found in Texas. Go Texas. Our cameras were there on a Texas ranch when rabbis from Jerusalem's Temple Institute carefully inspected the para adama, the red heifers. Five suitable heifers were found and later taken to Israel, where again we documented their whereabouts. There's little question that the subject of the heifers has stirred considerable interest in these prophetic times. So I spoke to prophecy expert Mark Hitchcock, author of the book The End, about his perspective. 
you know, red heifers. That's all you have to say. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about them nowadays. Uh, I was present at the selection process when the rabbis were inspecting them. It was a, it was a so sobering event, just mm -hmm. to say the least. Um, do you think this is a prophetic game changer, their appearance after what, say, 2,000 years, mm -hmm. pure red heifers? Well, I think it is. Just the fact that they're looking for them, I think, is a game changer. That's right. The fact that there's this kind of momentum to be searching for them. Yeah, they found these five red heifers. I think it's in Texas. They, mm -hmm. they, they arrived in Israel, I think, in September of last year of 2022. Yes. And uh, they're, they're, they're kind of watching them. They quarantined them for a while. I think they're too young. Now, they have to be at least three years of yeah. age. So they're waiting till they're that age. Uh, but I understand, too, that, that they believe that these red heifers, the red heifer ceremony of slaying them and reducing them to ashes has to occur overlooking where they can see the Temple Mount. That's true. And they purchased some land over mm -hmm. on the Mount of Olives where this can take place. So all these, uh, all these things are in place, but they, they're going to have to have red heifers for the purification of the priests. Yes for the, the third temple. So I think it is prophetically significant. Now, whether these five or the five or not. If they stay pure or not, yeah. That's right. And, and uh, you know, they, could, they could certainly be, be the, the, the five if it's going to happen within you know, some, some period of time. But mm -hmm. uh, we don't know that for sure. But to me, it's just the fact that they're, they're, they're trying to get these red heifers together. They've already got you know, the menorah there, the Temple Institute's yeah. collecting all these implements. They're trying to you know, have a, a priesthood established. So all these things are kind of converging at the same time, but the, the red heifers, I think, is a really an important piece to that puzzle. And I do think it's prophetically significant. On a past program in this series, we documented the place where the ashes of a red heifer will be gathered on the Mount of Olives, facing the Eastern Gate. Dr. Seif continues from that gate along the eastern wall of the Temple Mount. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, earlier in his book, when I say earlier, it's because I'm in chapter 44 here, gave voice to the fact that Hebrews are going to be regathered uh, from the world over and uh, come back to the nation of Israel. And he in, goes into great detail about a temple that's going to be rebuilt. And it's not just a model temple. I want to look in chapter 44 and read a few verses. Beginning in verse 15, he says, the priests and the Levites that kept charge of the sanctuary in days past, they are going to come again. He says uh, in verse 15, the umdu lifonai, and they shall minister before me once again. There's an emergent priesthood and there is ministry of priesthood. In verse 16, uh, it's even more explicit. He says, Hema yavau el mikdashi, and they shall enter into my sanctuary. And for them to enter into a sanctuary, there has to be a sanctuary. If you take the Bible literally, it gives voice to a reemergent complex to uh, attend to this business. Vehema yik revu el shochani. And they shall come near to my table, he says, the Sartani, and minister unto me. It's very interesting that uh, when you look at biblical literature, the Ezekiel text specifically here, but it's not exclusive to this. Uh, there's an understanding that in the eschaton, that is in days future, there is going to be a redeveloped temple. And it begs the question, what ought Christians to do with this, particularly those that uh, it seems to offend sense and sensibility? A few things, first of all, keep in mind that when we take the Lord's Supper in, in church, uh, the minister is acting in effect as a priest and uh, he is in effect remembering the sacrifice and then giving it to others, akin to what priests would do in the temple complex. Now, in a communion service, Eucharist, call it what you will, it's commemorative in nature. Uh, it's symbolic. In terms of the refabrication of a temple complex and a priesthood, it's symbolic as well. Evangelicals that envision there is a coming temple, uh, don't, uh, even with all that, there's an understanding that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and high priest and that business is taken care of. But there's a cogent argument that there are sacrifices that are instituted as a commemoration of the ultimate sacrifice, and that is the person of Jesus. We've already seen in this series how the altar of sacrifice played an important place in the tabernacle. It pictured what was to come in the temple and also served as a map of God's salvation plan. Ariel Sims tells us more. It, there's, there's so much in the tabernacle, and I mean throughout the entire Old Testament, but especially in the tabernacle, that, that 
that points to Yeshua, to Jesus. What the tabernacle really is, is it, it is a map of God's salvation plan. The, the, the beginning of the, uh, of the map, the start of the map, where we are, is separation from God in our sin. And the end point, the X, where the treasure is buried, where we want to get to, that's back to the Holy of Holies, back to the presence of God, back to our relationship with Him, or back to the Garden of Eden, what God originally intended. And so what the tabernacle is, is that it's a map that shows the process uh, of what needs to happen if we want to get back to, to a relationship with, with God, back to, into His presence and glory. So, so even before we, we talk about Yeshua and Jesus, we just see, first of all, for example, the altar being the first item that we see when we come into the courtyard. If you want, if you want to get to God, first there must be a sacrifice. And it's through the sacrifice that we are purified, which is what the, the wash base represents. We cannot be purified without a sacrifice first. So it's through the blood of the sacrifice that we are purified, and then we can enter into God's presence. Even before the altar, we have the gate. The gate uh, that was the only way to enter into, into the courtyard in the first place. If anyone tried to sneak in through uh, any other way into the, into the courtyard, under the fence or whatever, they would die. So the gate was the only way to come in. Yeshua says, I am the gate. So when he says, I am the gate, he's talking to Pharisees, educated, learned Jews who know exactly what he means when he says, I am the gate, where he's referencing the gate of the courtyard, basically saying, I am the only way to get to God. Um, Yeshua says, I am the bread of life. He's referencing the showbread, where he's basically saying, I am the provider. Or when he says, I am the light of the world, he's referencing the menorah, uh, where he sa he's the light of the world. The menorah represents Yeshua as the light of the world. So really everything points to Yeshua and he references the tabernacle when he, when he says many of these I am's throughout the Gospel of John. And the, the ultimate purpose of the tabernacle back then was to be a dwelling place for God. The very first thing that God says about the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 25, God talks to Moses on Mount Sinai and he says, build me a tabernacle that I may dwell among them. Then he is talking about the Israelites. So the tabernacle, first and foremost, is meant to be a dwelling place for the Lord. But the word among, in Hebrew, when God says, I want to dwell among my people, in Hebrew it actually says, shechanti betocham. Betoch means inside, not among or with or next to, but inside. Why would God use that type of language? Because God dwelling in the tabernacle symbolizes how he dwells inside of us today. That's why Paul calls us the tabernacle of God, because God dwelling in the tabernacle symbolizes him dwelling in us today. Or if you add that element of us being the tabernacle to, let's say, the menorah, which represents Yeshua being the source of light, the light of the world, we are the tabernacle, Yeshua is the light. Just as the walls of the tabernacle reflect the light of the menorah, we also need to reflect the light of Jesus, of Yeshua. So it, that's just one of many, many things of how this all points to Yeshua, to salvation through Yeshua. Many of you watching today can say, I have stood where that tabernacle replica stands. It's amazing. We take you there on tour. If you haven't been, it will change your life like it's changed our lives. We go both in the spring and the fall. Please join us on a tour to Israel. It's right. life-changing. The whole series is about the temple and the mm -hmm. Dateline Jerusalem. And, and Ariel was teaching from this tabernacle, and yeah. it's in the wilderness. It's in the Timna Valley right near Elot. We go there. We stand there. These wonderful Messianic believers teach about this tabernacle. It's so mm -hmm. important, isn't it? It can be easy for all these details to become rhetoric, to become a college course. My first time in Israel was the same way. Everything sprung to life because of the visual tangibility of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeshua spoke to the Jews of that day, knowing that they were agrarian farmers, speaking to them in a language and terminology that they understood so that they could learn not just rhetoric, but something that would cut to their heart. Terms like the threshing floor immediately spoke to them. Yeah. That's how we separate the good wheat from the chaff. He then used that for so many different principles. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to be able to experience that so it gets inside of you. And there's a prophetic fulfillment in all that in the harvest. You look at 
Israel's three harvests that happened in the year. You had your spring first fruits harvest of barley, your summer Shavuot harvest of the wheat, and then your fall harvest of the grapes. And those directly coincide with prophetic events that will be fulfilled in the future. So for example, the barley harvest, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, is the harpazo, the rapture of the bride of Christ. We will fulfill that harvest of souls. We're separated from the earth, you know, we're taken to be with Messiah. But then the wheat harvest is the next one that happens. That doesn't occur until the end of the tribulation, in which in Matthew 24, 30 through 31, Yeshua sends his angels to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. Uh, but they still have to endure the pressure of being in that threshing floor with the sleds that, that pushed against them to separate that wheat from the chaff. So it's not fun. You don't want to be a part of that wheat harvest and endure the tribulation. But the final harvest is the most heartbreaking. And it's the grape harvest that Yeshua himself uh, in Revelation 14, 14 through 20, he goes and he slices and dices with the sword from his mouth at the bow of Armageddon. And he crushes those grapes, filling the valley up to the horse's bridle with blood. Mm -hmm. This is a horrific event. And we can choose now which harvest you're going to be a part of. Are you going to be a part of that first barley harvest and get to be with your Messiah forever in heaven? Or are you going to endure the pain and the suffering of the tribulation? If you don't choose, it's chosen for you. Sometimes the information can seem very overwhelming. This specific topic with prophecy and whatnot yeah. is actually detailed out, so you don't have to rewind a million times here what Caleb <laughs> said. There's a book. Tell them about that book, Caleb. Mark Hitchcock's book, The End. We're giving it to you as a gift to anyone who gives an offering to this ministry. It also comes with these bookmarks. It has scriptures that are encouraging, dealing with the prophetic end that Josh and I came up with ourselves. And we hope that you give so that we can give this resource to you and you can learn more about prophecy that God has in store for you. I would also like to thank all of you, our viewers. This program, this whole series is because you are giving people mm. and you make this possible. So when you donate online, or if you donate through an app or write a check, you are making this program all about prophecy go to people around the world. So thank you so much. It's been a great day, a lot to take in. Yes, yes it's been <laughs> great. It's time to end, guys. As we always say, Shalu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource this week, The End, written by Mark Hitchcock. This 500-page hardcover book is made available to you for your generous donation to Zola Levitt Ministries. The accompanying bookmark by Joshua and Caleb provides important scripture from God's Word concerning the end. Please remember, we depend on your generous gifts, which allow us to bring timely updates regarding Bible prophecy and the end of days. Thank you so much for your continuous support of this ministry. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.